Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time. My name is Michael Teddy. I'm going to talk to you about machine learning, some of its applications, particularly what it can tell us about the brain. So machine learning is really a subfield of artificial intelligence that's trying to get a computer to learn things about data without, um, with minimal instruction from the user. So this is very different from many of the traditional engineering or robotics approaches where you try and make all these expert systems and um, tell the computer what to do at every step of the way. That didn't work for many obvious reasons. Much of the recent popularity and power of machine learning is mainly due to these, the use of these artificial neural networks, which we'll get to in a minute. So this is kind of the paradigm we'll be working in today. This is a Skinner box, it's a very famous psycho uh, psychological experiment, if you don't know. It was performed by B.F. Skinner in the early part of the 20th century. So basically, he put a rat in the box, and in one situation, the rat pressed the lever and it was, it received food. In another scenario, it was continually shocked until it pressed the lever and the shock was removed. So in both cases, the rat learned very quickly uh, that the lever represented reward and it continually pre uh, pressed the lever. So meet Robin. This is our uh, robot here. This is a lab rat of the 21st century. It's got a video camera, infrared, um, can play sounds, hear sounds, uh, move treads, move back and forth. So we, this stands for, uh, its name is Robin, so it stands for Rover Autonomous Land Vehicle and Neural Network. And it's based off this uh, first self-driving car ever by Dean Pomerleau of Carnegie Mellon University in 1990. Right, this thing ran, also ran off a neural network and it performed very well. The thing was, you literally needed a truck full of equipment to, to get it to run and do all the necessary computations at the time. Uh, so, due to, due to, due to uh, advancements in hardware and software over the past couple decades, we've been able to recreate this even better, I would say, in a, in a compact and inexpensive uh, rover like this. And this, this, uh, they both drive autonomously and can uh, perform very well using this neural network. So what Robin sees, what any computer sees, uh, doesn't see an image like we see, it just sees a bunch of numbers. So every pixel has a number associated with it, and it just tells it how bright that pixel is. So that, that, would, that would be how Robin sees this image. Uh, so, if we want to get Robin to identify images and, and learn from them, we, we use this thing called an artificial neural network. This is what it looks like. This is a very simple depiction. So we have an input layer, an output layer, and a hidden or intermediate layer. You can have more than one hidden layer. That's where deep learning and Google's DeepMind come from. And you can have more than one output node. So each node or neuron uh, is connected or synapsed with uh, every other node in the adjacent layer, as you can see. So the network is very robust. And since our image is a Oh, and each, each uh, connection has a weight associated with it. So a higher weight and equals a stronger connection, essentially, for going the biological scheme. So each, uh, if our image is a matrix of numbers, we can actually, this, uh, this top pink image here, we can actually take the, uh, all the numbers and put them in a, a column, stack them on top of each other, so we just have a column of numbers, called a vector. So that we feed to the network. So essentially, each number is uh, an input node to the, to the network. And you feed that through, and each, each uh, node in the hidden layer and the output layer will fire based on some activation function. Typically, um, the sigmoid function as you see in the top right. So if you have high activation, it'll fire, produce a one. If uh, you have low activation, it will produce, produce a zero and won't fire. So the memory is really stored in the weights. That's where all the power and, uh, and memory is uh, in this network, in the weights. So we want to try and modify the weights so that certain input patterns produce certain outputs. So how do we do that? We, we uh, run all our data through the network. So run every single image through the network, or, or part of them, depending on what you're doing. And you compute this error function, j. This is a typical algorithm. There's many different algorithms out there. You compute the error for each image based on the output you wanted and based on the, uh, the actual output. So you have some error associated with the network for each image. And the way that we, so we want to lower this error, right? And the way we do that is we, mod we modify the weights a certain way. To modify the weights, we find the error associated with the output and back propagate it throughout the network so that you can actually find um, the error for every single node in the network. And once you do that, it allows you to find a gradient of partial derivatives. And uh, the gradient of the partial derivative for each weight tells it how to modify that particular weight so that we lower the error. And we do this a bunch of uh, we do a bunch of iterations of this and eventually get the error down to zero or very low. So it kind of produces a type of topology here. Uh, if you have millions of weights or hundreds of thousands, which you typically do, you can't, uh, can't actually visualize this. This is only two weights, this data is here. And you're trying to, um, you're trying to lower the J, the error. So you, can, uh, you just want to go downhill, basically, get the lowest J possible. 
So what we're working on, uh, actually, need to click on this. So this is uh, this is only two minutes long, just to see, just to get you to see uh, how long it is. And we ha basically have a this is our uh, automated Skinner box where we just have different colors inside of the box, and we show it different colors. And every time we show it a different color, we tell it to do a certain thing. So this color, it's going uh, turning left, and then we'll, we'll just keep doing that until it learns. And so, as you can see, the the uh, length of this video is only two minutes long. And within two minutes, without without telling it anything about a color or anything what to do, it actually learns what we want it to do in about a minute and a half. So we'll get to that soon. So I'm just going to change the color. And right now I'm controlling and telling it what to do. So I'm telling it to uh, turn left at this point or turn right for when you see this color. And I keep doing this for four different colors and four different behaviors. Until it actually learns to do it on its own. So this is this is called online learning because we're actually training the network while we're while we're uh, we're performing some action. We're not doing it and then doing the action after. So once we get back around to this blue color here, um, it actually it'll actually be doing it on its own. You won't be able to see, but I won't be pressing the button. It learned in that in that short amount of time four different behaviors in the presence of four different stimuli, and we didn't tell it what to do. So it's actually doing it on, on its own now, so I'm not going to go through the rest of the video. So here's another one. After we trained it, we told it, we told it to go forward on pink, so it liked pink. And this is it following a pink cart around outside by the breezeway here. So it's just following the pink cart. It likes the color pink at that point. We trained it. So as you can see, it's just following the color. And it can follow objects too. We can do this with anything. It's just not just colors. That's the power of these networks. So I'll just skip ahead here. So as you can see, the Robin learns to perform multiple uh, arbitrary behaviors in a short amount of time, less than two minutes. And so this could actually be a possible replacement for, for um, laboratory rats or any other experimental animals, right? It's kind of barbaric what we do to uh, these rats and these other animals this doesn't really make sense in the 21st century. And also, through other possible, uh, through other things we're working on in the lab, we've actually shown a mathematical basis to explain you know, these computations that the brain is making uh, with all of its cells. There's a mathematical basis for everything that it does. Yeah, that's it. I'm done. Questions? Uh, questions? I don't want to touch the rubber. <laughs> Put it over here. So, yeah, I, I feel like I want to ask why. And I understand why? you talked about taking the place of the, the rats. Mm -hmm. But when, I guess I, I think of a living creature, what all would you have to do to train it to replicate that? I mean, so I understand the colors, but what, do you, what else do you think you would have to train it to do to take the place of a living creature. Well, we're not really trying to pick the place of a living creature. We're trying to pick and pick and choose what it can tell us about the brain, what the brain can help us learn about machines. Um, so actually, we have actually, through, through these techniques, we've found a mathematical basis for all the computations and, and how the feature detection work actually works in the brain. So, you know, if you, if you want to plug your, your eye uh, circuit from the, from the part of the brain that controls vision, you plug it to your ear, you can actually see with your ears, as, as I'm sure many of you know. You can see with your ear. Just because the cells that were formerly connected to the eye are just doing the same computation, but different stimulus. So that's the basis of what we're doing. All these, that's basically saying all these nodes are just doing one computation. It's, it's, just, uh, it's just all similar. We can, we can theoretically plug any amount of data or any stimulus in here, and it can work. Yeah? So the guy at the Tesla store says the car drives itself. How do you think this relates to that? 
oh yeah, Tesla, it's, that's a huge thing, you know, um, autom uh, autom autonomous vehicles. As I showed, we had uh, Alvin in the 1990s with that big truck. So usually Tesla's cheating a little bit, well, most of the autonomous cars nowadays are cheating a little bit, they have a range finder going around it, and they just use a neural network, the same thing that we used here, to power the cars. It's very much the same thing, but just scaled up to a, a real, not a little rover, but a real car. Very much the same thing. So it's, it's everywhere, in our, everywhere in our everyday lives. And it's infecting us very rapidly. And if we don't get on board, then we'll be left behind. Yeah? I heard about AlphaGo being the best Go yeah. player. Yeah. Is yeah. this similar to that? Yeah, that's exactly the same thing. So if uh, most, of you, most of you don't know, um, the world champion of this very complicated Chinese game called Go uh, was beaten by a computer, Google's, Google's DeepMind, which I referenced in here uh, a couple weeks ago. And it's, it was formally thought by experts in the field that it wouldn't take, it wouldn't be done until 10 years from now. But we just did it four times in, uh, four times last week or two weeks ago, and using the same, very much the same technology that we're working on. How did it learn? It learned the same way. You just basically have to play the game a bunch of times, and then it basically learns by back propagation and finding the error and reducing that error. Is that different than when they put in? Chess? Oh no, it's very much the same thing. Uh, back in the 1940s, the father of really, really uh, art machine learning, Arthur Samuel, he actually had a, a similar thing. He created the first program to, to help you. He actually wanted the computer to beat him at chess or checkers, and he did back in 1940. That's kind of where this all started. He was he, uh, like a primitive neural network. So you really, you really could do anything with this. If you, you know, all we're seeing in data all around us, um, human beings, and we're taking it in and. It's just how do we sort it? And we're saying that we're really just doing this computation. Yeah. Uh, so in the game Go, the player champion yeah. he made a move that that tripped the computer up because he made a move that allowed the computer to go to two different ways. Mm -hmm. you, and that, that he won by doing that move. Is there is there a move where the computer, your computer, or your robot, yeah. will it uh, will it not be able to compute a function if there's Well, it just all goes back to what it was what it was trained on. So if it never if it had never seen that move or it had never even been near that, um, I'm sure it won't get beaten again. I'll tell you that. But um, what I will know, what I will say is that you know he, the computer won five times and uh, the champion only won once. So these methods are very powerful, and I would say that it probably just didn't see that uh, see that action before. Because in that in the game go, there's many different uh, ways to go and many different pieces going on. So it would be very hard to recreate that. In a, in, a, in a training set for the computer, unless it was in you know, live. Any other questions? 